In this talk, I'd like to explore the role of women in two of Shakespeare's most celebrated plays, Macbeth and King Lear, and film adaptations or films claiming to be inspired by these plays. When returning to that mainstay of State School Year 9 curriculums, Macbeth, I will include clips from Rupert Gould's 2010 Eastern European S production of the play and two films inspired or based on the play, the largely excruciating 1990 gang-centric film Men of Respect and the 1962 movie Siberian Lady Macbeth. I will then explore the role of women in King Lear and include clips from the 1971 Peter Brook production in which my namesake minus the H takes on the leading role, the more recent production starring Ian McKellen and another Shakespeare inspired film, Jocelyn Morehouse's film version of Jane Smiley's excellent reworking of King Lear, A Thousand Acres. The aim will be to look at Shakespeare's and the subsequent presentation of women. To what extent can blame be lobbed in their direction for the downfall of the men and themselves in their lives? To what extent do the actions of women directly result in unhappiness, conflict and ultimately death? And can it be possible to gain some kind of insight into Shakespeare's own views of women through the presentation of women in his plays? The aim of this talk also is to be fun. I've deliberately included fair use clips from some of the lesser known films that purport to be inspired by Shakespeare so that comparisons can be made with the original text and further questions can be asked about the role and evolution of Shakespeare today. So let's start with Macbeth and consider that woman whose name, as much as any in Shakespeare's plays, has become synonymous with manipulative, power-hungry, evil, Lady Macbeth. Recently, the SNP leader, Nicola Sturgeon, was labelled Lady Macbeth in high heels by critics keen to demonise her. Now, I must confess that I'm not an enormous fan of Miss Sturgeon, but is she really in the same bracket as someone who helped set her husband on a devastated mur murderous journey and was labelled fiend-like at the end of the play? But the fact a modern politician can be metaphorically branded a historical figure made famous by Shakespeare and its meaning immediately understood illustrates the hold Lady Macbeth still has upon the world's consciousness. Why is that? Well, let's look a little more closely. Although three other women plant the idea of murder into Macbeth's head first, the three witches, it is Lady Macbeth who goads her husband into going through with the heinous deed of killing their Scottish king when he is having serious doubts. In Act 1, Scene 7 of the play, she attacks Macbeth remorselessly by suggesting that a withdrawal from the plan to kill would reveal weakness and unmanliness. Remember, if ever there was a man with a capital M, it would surely be Macbeth as shown by breathless accounts of his splendid head chopping and navel splitting earlier in the play. When you durst do it, then you were a man. And to be more than what you were, you would be so much more than man. As well as attacking manhood, something which guarantees to make us, even us modern enlightened men, defensive and awkward, she manipulates her own femininity by shamelessly and emotively rehashing a story of breastfeeding her now presumably dead child. I have given suck, and know how tender it is to love the babe that milks me. I would, while it was smiling in my face, have plucked my nipple from his boneless gums and dashed the brains out, had I so sworn as you have done to this. The combination of the threat of psychotic violence and the image of innocent maternal suckling is truly terrifying. I've read or heard these famous words at least a hundred times, yet they have lost none of their disturbing power to shock. Why is this, I wonder? Well, one key reason must be what we, and I hope I'm accurate in saying we as a human race, not just we as men, expect and hold dear from mothers. We take it for granted that mothers will nurture, love, cherish their babies, which means that even to this day, some of the symptoms of postnatal depression are not openly discussed or countenanced. For a woman not to instinctively nurture, love and cherish is considered a repugnant impossibility. 
But here Lady Macbeth goes much further. She hypothetically suggests that she would smash her baby's brains out if she had said she would kill someone but changed her mind at the last minute. Coming from a man stereotypically prone to acts of violence which in the past may have been deemed heroic through the vehicle of war, these lines would disturb but nowhere near to the same extent as from a woman or mother. Certainly the words are effective and of course it is one thing suggesting that you would dash out the brains of your baby in certain circumstances and another carrying it out. Nonetheless Macbeth's subsequent tentative question, if we should fail, shows that he has been swayed by his wife's emotive rhetoric. He commits the murder at the end of the following scene. Lady Macbeth doesn't just distinguish herself through verbal diatribes, but practical assistance too. She personally drugs King Duncan's guards and lays out the daggers Macbeth is to use to commit the murder. So to some significant extent, Lady Macbeth is to blame for a bloody deed which will ultimately trigger a rapid descent into madness for herself and ever more violent and bloodthirsty despotism and paranoia from her husband. But of course, simply reading, thinking about and analysing a playtext can only by definition reveal part of its meaning. Would a Lady Macbeth physically shaking, grasping a visible breast and obviously mentally ill while delivering lines about giving suck and dashing brains be as culpable for her husband's subsequent actions as a Lady Macbeth icily in control, eyes blazing and body poised? Or to return to specific films, is the Lady Macbeth who urges her husband to kill his gangster boss Duncan, as is the case in Geoffrey Wright's Australian 2006 version, quite so morally culpable as the Lady Macbeth who contributes to the death of a divinely ordained king, as is Shakespeare's original intention? With respect to the former, aren't words about dashing brains out to be expected from a tightly knit group of immoral, violent drug dealers and their partners, but not so much from Scottish aristocrats. Gould's 2010 film production sees the setting of the play transformed from 11th century Scotland to an unknown 20th century Eastern European dictatorship. Macbeth's mind has become entranced with the possibility of becoming the new dictator and is regaled in full military uniform when accosted by his wife. I dare do all that may become a man. Who dares do more is none. What beast was then that made you break this enterprise to me? When you durst do it, then you were a man. And to be more than what you were, you would be so much more the man. Nor time nor place did then adhere, and yet you would make both. They have made themselves. And that their fitness now does unmake you. given suck and know how tender it is to love the babe that milks me I would while it was smiling in my face have plucked my nipple from his boneless gums and dashed the brains out and I so sworn as you have done to this mm -hmm. The wearing of the uniform serves as an additional visual reminder of Macbeth's manly persona, something which his wife deliberately probes in order to achieve her goals of additional power and prestige. The director, Rupert Gould, has Lady Macbeth brandishing a delicious looking chocolate cake as she delivers her psychotic speech about giving suck and potentially dashing baby brains and the effect is to intensify her terrifying combination of surface female conformity with lurking beneath the surface manipulative violence. It seems strange to say it, but there's something about the holding of the chocolate cake whilst delivering these lines which makes me hold this Lady Macbeth more responsible for what happens. She seems a perfect hostess with sumptuous cooked meat and sweet delights impeccably prepared for her guests the contrast between this controlled, domestic, superwoman front and her murderous, violent intent implies icy control 
and that this woman must take her full share of blame for the effects of her actions. William Riley's 1990 film, Men of Respect, follows Shakespeare's plot faithfully, perhaps too faithfully if you agree with Daniel Rosenthal writing in a hundred Shakespeare films, but uses a new script and a similar gangster set up to that employed by Geoffrey Wright in the aforementioned 2006 Macbeth. Charlie D'Amico is the padrino, the godfather and Duncan figure, whilst Mike Battaglia is the heroic group member who gets promoted following an extraordinarily brave and successful shootout. Battaglia is of course Macbeth, who is influenced by a fortune teller's wife and to some extent his own ambition into killing Charlie D'Amico and therefore assuming over, overall control himself. There is no question that the director is extraordinarily faithful to Shakespeare's original plot. We have all the key characters. Vinnie Cordero is the traitorous Thane of Cordor. Banky Como is Banquo, and he has an ominously initially lurking in the background son, but no wife. The bleeding captain of Act 1, Scene 2 is Sal, who lords Battaglia's bravery by gushing, it was Battaglia, what a piece of work this guy is. Duffy, in his own words, a mean fucking Irishman, who confirms late in the film much to Battaglia's dismay that the intern ripped the little fucker, meaning himself, from her belly, is Macduff. And to return to the main focus of this talk, Battaglia's wife, Ruthie, represents Lady Macbeth, and is not averse to manipulating her femininity in order to get her own way. However, it strikes me that she is far less to blame for her husband's downfall than in Shakespeare's original. Firstly, look at the transformation of the Act 1, Scene 7, I have given suck, scene. Was he asking for me? What do you think? I think I better get downstairs. Wait a minute. You're not losing your nerve. Just let it go, all right? I can see it in your face. You're fighting yourself over this thing. Hey, what am I going to do? Put a gun to his head now? The man is applauding me here. I should be watching his back, not sticking the knife in myself. He's throwing you a bone because he's desperate. He's showing me respect, all right? I want I should enjoy it already. Charlie's just keeping you down. The Tamikos are always going to keep you down. It makes me sick how they use you. You do everything. They do nothing. But they have everything, and we don't have anything. If you could take it from them, take it. You deserve it. I want you to have it. It's not yours to give, babe. Don't mock me, Michael. Why don't you understand how impossible this is? It's not the time for this. Don't tell me how impossible it is. Don't tell me it's not the time. I don't understand. Because I've heard it all before, and I do understand. Don't. Don't go into that. I will. I will go into it. I don't want to hear about this now. Well, you can hear about it. Because I know what it is to do something so it could break your heart. Don't! I know what it is to have a life inside me. It's squashing it out. Because it's not the right time. It's too difficult. I know what it is to kill for you, Michael. So don't tell me I don't understand. So Rufi Batania, like her Shakespearean counterpart, is prepared to use her femininity to her advantage. But unlike Lady Macbeth, who would appear to have lost a baby she suckled at some point, and there is no suggestion that this was caused by her husband, Rufy's lines show that Mike coerced her into having an abortion, which caused her, and still causes her, a huge amount of emotional anguish. Whereas Lady Macbeth talks theoretically about bashing the brains of a presumed now dead baby, Rufy Battaglia refers to the time her husband helped cause the death of a baby growing inside her. Her argument is a somewhat bizarre one, that because she killed her unborn fetus for him, he should kill Charlie D'Amico for her, and indeed for them both. <coughs> <coughs> the fact this argument is ridiculous is beside the point. Ruthie is clearly emotionally blackmailing her husband with one of her feminine trump cards, the reluctantly agreed abortion, 
clearly remains an obvious bone of contention between them. Lady Macbeth also emotionally blackmails her husband by referring to the breastfeeding of a child, which the audience must presume is dead. Yet the lasting impression from her lines is not sympathy, but simply that the woman is an absolute psychopath. Rufi Battaglia is nowhere near as psychopathic as Lady Macbeth. With this scene, we are far more likely to pass judgment on her husband rather than her and empathise with her past pain. There are other ways in which Ruthie Battaglia is a character of greater sympathy than her Shakespearean counterpart and less to blame for the pair's downfall. As the title Men of Respect infers, as a woman, she is continually excluded from her husband's gangland activities, which, unlike Macbeth's battles, are simmering, at least in the background, throughout the course of the film. In Shakespeare's original, Norway's attack, Cordor's betrayal, are temporary potential disasters which require men to respond collectively at the exclusion of women. In contrast, in men of respect, the gangs are permanently planning and plotting, and it is clear that this thing, as it is called so pointedly by the Duncan figure, Charlie D'Amico, could only involve men. Have a look at the equivalent scene to Act 1, Scene 4, in which Charlie D'Amico rewards Battaglia for his strength, courage and loyalty. We are a fraternity of great honor, and we welcome only men of strength, courage, and loyalty, men of respect. Our way comes before anything else in life, before God, before country, before family. You have sworn an oath, and we have embraced you. you have obeyed our laws without question, and you have guarded the secrets of our thing. And you have shown respect and loyalty, no less than a son. You are the fruit of our enterprise, and you have earned yourself a very special place in our thing. the blood. Buona salute, capo regime. Battaglia. The exclusion of women is far more aggressive and explicit than in Shakespeare's original. In Macbeth, it is taken for granted that a woman can never be in a position to, for example, be anointed the next Prince of Cumberland. And so Act 1, Scene 4 focuses on the strengths of the individuals, Macbeth and Banquo, who of course are male. <coughs> However, in many respects, Charlie D'Amico ceremoniously declares that they welcome only men of strength courage and loyalty, men of respect, and even goes on to state that our way comes before anything else in life, before God, before country, before family, thus indirectly relegating Rufi Battaglia to a record low fourth place in a life's priorities list. Battaglia becomes obsessed with this idea of respect. During the clip we saw earlier, he responded, he responded indignantly, he's showing me respect, all right? to his wife's questions about losing his nerve. But this quest for male-sanctioned respect has a corrosive effect on his own relationship with Ruthie and certainly the latter's self-esteem. No wonder she has no qualms about egging on her husband to kill his king or Petrino. After all, the man runs an operation which aims to elevate relationships strengthened by crime above all else. Yes, perhaps she deserves blame for egging on her husband to kill a, kill a man in their own home, who, to some extent, has to be considered a friend. However, the fact that murder within civilian life is so commonplace, and that her husband pressurised her into having an abortion, presumably so he could focus more successfully on the men's thing, 
makes her seem a far less blameworthy worthy figure than Lady Macbeth. There is something about Lady Macbeth which has captured the world's imagination, isn't there? And indeed many commentators feel the play's most successful moments feature her and that the play goes downhill when she becomes a relatively periphery figure in the middle and closing sections. Hence, it is no surprise that filmmakers frequently decide to give her a more prominent role than that included within Shakespeare's original play. In Andres Wajda's 1962 movie, Siberian Lady Macbeth, she becomes the protagonist, and I'd now like to spend some time considering her role within this film. Siberian Lady Macbeth is Katerina Lvovna, a pretty, listless housewife stuck within an isolated agricultural community in 19th century Matensk. As with Lady Macbeth and Men of Respect's Rufo Battaglia, reference is made early on to fertility. Whereas Lady Macbeth once suckled and Rufo Battaglia gritted her teeth through an abortion, Katerina has failed to get pregnant in spite of being married for five years. Functionally, and in this community and society, function is clearly everything. She is useless. Have a look at her unappealing, chomping father-in-law giving her the well-deserved bollocking such feeble infertility deserts. Evo, bačuška. Mogu li da odem sad oče? Možeš. I onako se samo vucaraš po kući. Pet godina si kod nas, pa ništa. Govorio sam ja budali da te ne uzima. Zatrećeš da mi pleme i seme. Neće gospoda se smiluje na tebe, jer se ti njega ne bojiš. Ajde, pita je, da li sa blagim srcem čita žitja svetih? Ajde, pita je, pitaj! Odnesi to u gostinsku sobu. You've done nothing for our house. Five years completely wasted. Our family would die out because of you, cries Katerina's father-in-law, Boris Ismailov, not mincing his words or considering the possibility that his son's sperm may be poor swimmers. And whereas the early stages of Macbeth are characterised by the close relationship between the Macbeths, Macbeth pens his wife a loving letter following his encounter with the witches in which he labels her his dearest partner of greatness. Katerina is shown alone, unfulfilled. Her husband is away inspecting a mill after a dam gave way and no one seems to have any idea when he will be back. Indeed, the harsh criticism from Katerina's father-in-law and her own desperation to conceive provoke initial sympathy from the viewer and make us wonder how this passive creature can possibly resemble Shakespeare's Lady Macbeth, whose famous lines appear in English within the opening credits to the movie. Come you spirits that tend on mortal thoughts, unsex me here, and fill me from the crown to the toe, top full of direst cruelty. Indeed, to a Western 21st century eye, there seems something touchingly naive and innocent about Katerina, as she adapts somewhat superstitious strategies in a bid to cure her perceived infertility. Katarina Ljubovna. Katarina Ljubovna. Svekart je Boris Timofejić otišao od kuće i radnici se rasturiše. Sad je prilika. Zar opet? Probat ćemo jednu vražbinu s kobilom. Treba ti bela košulja. Tako valja. Samo požuri. Idem ja napred. Kao? 
žao što ti... Ma govori već jednom. Ao što ti nisi ja u tvom rodu. Tako da Bog da. Tako da Bog da ja ne bila u mom. Ao što ti nisi jalova u tvom rodu. Tako da Bog da ja ne bila u mom. Amin da Bog da. Amin da Bog da. Kao što ti nisi jalova u tvom rodu, tako da Bog da ja ne bila u mom. Kao što ti nisi jalova u tvom rodu, tako da Bog da i ona ne bila u njenu. Meanwhile, a new pig herder, a serf, Sergei Jamalinov, has arrived on the farm. He's boisterous, loud, and enjoys estimating the weight of women by picking them up. In short, the polar opposite to quiet, withdrawn Katerina. She quickly falls for him and his fun. But her father-in-law finds out that they have slept together and proceeds to dish out 500 lashes to the lustful animal. During his confrontation with Katerina the following morning, he calls her a barren slut and declares that when your husband comes home, we'll drag you naked through the village. It is then that she recalls the rat poison which she had previously put away. Daj mi vode. Daj mi vode. Peče. Peče. Vode. Ne dam. Katerina stands and watches, refuses to give water, watches her father-in-law die, and all this after taking the rat poison while standing in front of a religious shrine. In Macbeth, Lady Macbeth may go to provide daggers, leave all the rest to me, but she doesn't herself kill, giving this gloriously curious passing explanation in Act 2, Scene 2. Had he not resembled my father as, I, as he slept, I had done it. But here in Siberian Lady Macbeth, she independently kills, not egged on or advised by anyone. So how do we react to this alteration? And does this somehow make her a more evil, a more blameworthy figure than Shakespeare's Lady Macbeth? Possibly, but there are other considerations. Firstly, there is the change in genre from play to film. In Shakespeare's Macbeth, the killing of Duncan takes place off stage between Act 2, Scene 1 and Act 2, Scene 2. The audience shouldn't see a thing. A murder actually shown on stage or screen, compared to one only fretted about, is bound to provoke stronger feelings of repulsion, particularly when in Shakespeare's case, the man murdered was such a decent, honourable, godlike figure. Although note that Shakespeare exaggerated this goodness from his source text of, of Hollingshead, who described him as lazy and negligent in punishing offenders, causing many misruled persons to trouble the peace and quiet state of the Commonwealth. However, Boris Ismailov is not the saintly figure of Duncan. He always seems to be eating. 
but the fact that Katerina can stand and watch him die an agonising death is disconcerting and affects the way we judge her. How can she look so generally calm? How can she deny him water? Boris is only Katerina's first victim. When her husband Zinofi returns and has heard rumours of his wife's affair, he is quickly polished off too. Sergei is now firmly established within the household as her partner. Have a listen to their snatched conversation following the unwanted husband's return. Once again, it is Katerina who is planning everything independently. It isn't leave all the rest to me, but rather leave everything to me, go along with it, then sleep with me. Sergei isn't allowed to finish his beseeching, listen, please, let's not do anything we... And Katerina's silencing kiss reveals both her willingness to commit acts of violence and passion for her lover. Katerina uses rat poison to kill her father-in-law and has the rat poison ready for her husband. However, during an angry confrontation in which he openly confesses her love for Sergei and brazenly snogs him in front of her raging husband, she successfully manhandles Zinofi to the floor and pins him there. Sergei then enters the fray and the men grapple. However, you can guess who inflicts the fatal blow. <laughs> And that's the second murder successfully completed. It is Katerina's fearlessness once again which is most striking. Do you think I'm afraid of you? Is her snorting rhetorical question, along with her physical strength. At the end of the film, when the pair's murderous deeds have caught up with them, resulting in a lifetime term exile to Siberia, Sergei is in no doubt that Katerina has slowly caused their ruin. Eyeing up another woman, Sonia, shuffling along in convict's chains, he bellows these words and still devoted to him, Katerina, shut up, you're to blame for all this, go away, do you hear me, you slut, get out of my sight. Katerina is astonished and devastated by this change of heart from the man she has loved so fiercely and indeed born a confiscated child with. The film ends with her dragging Sonia off a boat into freezing cold Siberian waters and the pair drowning together. The curious thing is that the viewer can't help feel sympathy for this triple murderer whose feelings of passion and subsequent love have carried her on a ruthless killing spree resulting in the deaths of singularly unattractive members of her husband's family, including himself. Yes, she is probably solely to blame for at least the death of her husband and father-in-law, yet I can't help but respect the consistency and the loyalty of her passionate feelings for Sergei within a brutal, primitive, unloving, harsh landscape, both in her far former home and Siberia. And this human portrayal of Katerina Lvovna, she's not a monster in spite of her crimes, reflects Shakespeare's representation of Lady Macbeth. 
If all we were to hear of the latter were, come to my woman's breasts and take my milk for gall, you murdering ministers, or I have given suck, we would conclude unequivocally that she was a fiend-like psychopath. But it's more complex. She, like Katerina, loves passionately and suffers. Her madness and pitiful paranoia about blood in Act 5, Scene 1 of the play do make her an object of pathos. Perhaps she deserves this madness for her part in her and Macbeth's staggeringly sharp downfall, but we pity her nonetheless. Macbeth contains only one main female character, Lady Macbeth. The witches and Hecate only appear sporadically, whilst Lady Macbeth, Macduff appears for the first time in Act 4, Scene 2 and dies at the end of Act 4, Scene 2. In King Lear, by contrast, there are three main female characters although the youngest is absent in France for significant chunks, Lear's daughters Goneril, Regan and Cordelia. In this play, we can split the roles played by women in causing tragedy into two definitive sections. Firstly, Cordelia's refusal to flatter or honour, depending on your take, her father in Act 1, Scene 1, and then Goneril and Regan's treatment of their father in their homes. Act 1, Scene 1 of King Lear is truly an extraordinary opening scene. Whereas in the first scene of Macbeth we have strange older women cackling cryptically on a heath, in Lear, following some opening laddish talk between three men, an entire court piles onto the stage to hear the king make momentous announcements. He reveals that he plans to abdicate his throne, kind of. The plan is to shake all cares and business from our age whilst retaining the name and all the addition to a king. In other words, he wants to keep the pomp, ceremony and honour of a king without any of the hassle or work. However, before this is to take place, Lear sets up a curious public competition of affection for his three daughters. Which of you, shall we say, doth love us most? Who will win and dazzle the court with their gushing proclamations of love? Well, Goddard and Regan play ball and talk of loving Lear more than eyesight, space and liberty, Goneril, or being an enemy to all other joys, Regan. Meanwhile, the youngest daughter Cordelia doesn't, in spite of clear hints of her father's preferment for her, as seen in the openly partisan suggestion that, with the right words, she could draw a third more opulent than her sisters. When asked to spout forth, her response is, nothing, my lord. Lear is astonished and repeats the word nothing in sheer disbelief. Cordelia, however, is emphatic and clear, nothing, she says, before finally clarifying that she is unable to heave her heart into her mouth. I love your majesty according to my bond, no more nor less. As I'm sure you all know, this causes Lear to erupt into an appalling rage and declare that she is no longer his daughter. Deprived of Cordelia's genuine love and support, Lear finds himself at the mercy of his other daughters, who, unsurprisingly, do not love him better than their eyesight or freedom. Arguments explode. Lear finds himself alone ranting on the heath. The kingdom implodes. Such cataclysmic events unquestionably stem to a significant extent from Cordelia's refusal to heave her heart into her mouth. Was she right to do so? Or should she take a large chunk of blame for her father's, and also indirectly her country's, subsequent downfall? The answer to this question is difficult to ascertain, and to some extent must be found by analysing clues about their relationship from this public scene, for the pair are not shown speaking without an audience until much later in the play, Act 4, Scene 7, by which time Lear has suffered some kind of mental breakdown. Well, in Act 1, Scene 1, Lear calls Cordelia our joy and suggests he is prepared to offer her more of the kingdom than her sisters. The poetic, metaphorical references to her suitors, the vines of France and the milk of Burgundy, once again hint at feelings of deep, loving respect. Only beautiful forces of nature could possibly be good enough for his daughter. He later freely admits, I loved her most and thought to set my rest on her kind nursery. This surely implies that the pair have spent plenty of time together, time in which Cordelia has looked after him, tended him well. Otherwise, why publicly make this declaration in front of other people, including his two other daughters? 
The fact Lear is so astonished by Cordelia's failure to join in the effusive love showers, puzzled, he questions her again and again, but goes thy heart with this, implies that he was previously 100% confident about her love for him, which of course begs the question as to why he felt the need for it to be verbalised so artificially. And this brings us on to Cordelia. She has clearly spent a great deal of time with her father. She must know what he is like. She must know, as the audience do minutes into the play, that he is a hot-tempered, stubborn, egotistical man whose internal systems are unable to process the concept of disobedience to his will. She must know all about his pride and the fact his admittedly tasteless competition has a large audience, making a refusal to take place all the more humiliating to him. During her revealing asides and the build-up to the momentous repetitions of nothing, she pityingly refers to herself as poor Cordelia and claims that she must love and be silent. Why? Could she not have opted for a middle way which avoided the excessive hyperbole adopted so cynically by her sisters, but which allowed the verbal public expression of feelings genuinely held? Did she really need to choose this particular moment to make a point of principle about the frequently tenuous link between words and reality, and in doing so, humiliate the father she loves? So in many ways, I am inclined to blame Cordelia, if not for the point she makes in Act 1, Scene 1, which is noble in its way, but the setting and timing she chooses, which have such far-reaching consequences. But once again, with Shakespeare, the printed text can only reveal some of the meaning. The rest is left to the interpretation of directors and actors, and audiences as well. For example, would Aaliyah light-heartedly, lovingly, and self-deprecatingly asking, as a last throw of the rolling dice, so to speak, for his daughters to humour him on this final occasion, be as deserving of nothings as a cold, despotic automaton? Which brings us on nicely onto Peter Brooks' version of Lear, starring my namesake minus the H. The film starts in complete silence. Indeed, there is no sound at all for the first two minutes, during which time the camera pans across solemn, still, worn-looking, ordinary people. As well as the ordinary people, members of the royal court are also waiting silently. The effect of all this silence is to create an uneasy, stark atmosphere, one that is rigidly, repressively controlled. A cough, a whispered, amusing remark, a, uh, when are we going to get started, all seem an impossibility within this freezing, gloomy environment. The camera then switches to a close-up of Lear himself, and for a full further 12 seconds the man remains silent before starting from lines 36 of Act 1, Scene 1 of Shakespeare's original and the curious imperative no. What I find fascinating is Lear's lack of movement as he speaks. Whereas I characterise Boris Ismailov in Siberian Lady Macbeth by his permanent eating, here Schofield's Lear seems to be distinguished by the lack of his neck movements. It just doesn't move forcing the audience and other characters on screen to focus almost exclusively on his deliberate, precise enunciation. He plans to shake all cares and business from our age, conferring them on younger strengths, while we, unburdened, crawl toward death. When it comes to addressing Cornwall and Albany, still the neck remains rigidly in place, and instead the eyes shift cursely towards where the men are seated. 
but the camera remains fixed on a close-up of this strange, cold, bearded individual, clad with some enormous fur shaping his head. Brooks's message is, is unequivocal. He wants to present Lear as a detached, cold king, seemingly devoid of any warmth or personality, thus making his subsequent requests for human declarations of love seem all the more peculiar. Brooks cuts Cordelia's asides. They would be impossible within this creepily silent environment. And she is first shown from above, sitting completely on her own, looking vulnerable. Now, our joy, although our last and least, to whose young love the vines of France and milk of Burgundy strive to be interest. What can you say to draw a third more opulent than your sisters? Nothing, my lord. Nothing. Nothing. Nothing will come of nothing. Speak again. I love your majesty according to my bond. No more, nor less. That goes her heart with this. I, my good lord. So young and so untender. So young, my lord. And true. Let it be so. Thy truth then be thy dower. Will by the secret reading us of the sun, the mysteries of Hecate in the night, by all the operation of the orbs, from whom we exist and cease to be, here I disclaim all my paternal care. And as a stranger to my heart and me, hold thee from this forever. Once again, the camera angles are chosen to reinforce Brooks's interpretation of Shakespeare's Lear as frozen, detached, as far removed from the warmth of loving touch as it is possible to be. When Lear says, nothing will come of nothing, speak again, the camera is positioned behind the right of Cordelia so that you can see her perspective which is her father come king, solemnly sat metres away from her, enclosed in something which, entirely, entirely fittingly, represents an upright coffin. In this production, questions about why Cordelia feels unable to respond to her father's demand for love on tap are easier to answer. There are literally hundreds of people looking on, not just her own family, royal friends and related entourage. You can hear a pin drop within the sub-zero silence, Whilst her father makes no loving movements or gestures whatsoever to encourage compliance and just stares at her, speaking slowly, is this really an environmental behaviour conducive to talking about love? A comparison with Ian McKellen's Lear in the same scene highlights this point. McKellen's Lear seems to defy this ingratiating love content on a cheerful whim and his neck moves as he introduces the concept. Divest us both of rule, interest, territory, cares of state. Which of you, shall we say, doth love us most? That we our largest bounty may extend where nature doth with merit challenge. <laughs> McKellen's Lear can smile, can make gleaming eye contact, can move his arms upwards to freely illustrate a point. His daughter's shocked expressions show that they are not pleased with their father's whim, perhaps the latest in a long line of self-indulgent caprices. But nonetheless, this old codger has a degree of charm and humanity entirely missing from Schofield's Lear. The effect of these differences? Well, the more personable and likeable Lear is, the more we are likely to feel that Cordelia should have been a wee bit more obliging when asked to do the same as her sisters. Schofield's Lear is an unforgettably cold, meaning that Cordelia is not blamed to the same extent for her failures to participate. 
thus unwittingly setting off a chain of so much havoc. But of course it is Goron and Regan who are traditionally cast as the female villains of the play, not poor, sweet, innocent, angel-like Cordelia. But yet, as ever in Shakespeare and life, there are two sides to every story. The end of Act 1, Scene 1, sees the two elder sisters conferring confidentially. And although there is a distinct lack of romanticism in their descriptions of their father, from what we have seen of him so far, their comments ring true. Goneril says honestly, he always loved our sister most, and with what poor judgment he hath now cast, off, cast her off appears too grossly whilst Regan worries that he may behave irrationally and impulsively more regularly. Lear unquestionably displayed poor judgment in disinheriting both Cordelia and Kent, his two closest allies, and it is natural for the daughters to worry that such behaviour may cause themselves problems in the future, and so it proves. In the third scene of the first act, Goneril claims that Lear has been an appalling house guest, critical, causing conflict, and are unable to control his huge retinue of a hundred knights. So far, so reasonable. Goneril has every right to express frustrations with the above, and certainly a man who could spout vitriolic language on the scale of barbarous Scythians and gorging appetites following a daughter's reasoned refusal to issue pompous declarations of love is likely to be easily roused in other circumstances. However, what I find uncomfortable here is who Goneril is speaking to. Her steward, Oswald. Not her husband, Albany, but a social inferior. And remember, she is talking about a king. But it gets worse. She issues these specific instructions. Put on what weary negligence you please, you and your fellows. In other words, deliberately get all the servants in the household to show disrespect and disinterest in the king's instructions. Later in the same speech, she shares this opinion about old people in general. Now by my life, old fools are babes again and must be used with checks as flatteries. Now, irrespective of your frustrations, and Shakespeare does not specify the time period in which Lear has been causing havoc, supposedly in Goneril's house, but given this scene is only Act 1, Scene 3, it will probably not be in more than a few days. There is something deeply distasteful and immoral about Goneril's underhand tactics here in ordering a servant to behave thus. The right thing to do would surely be to take Lear to one side and share your concerns privately with him. However, Lear's treatment of Cordelia in Act 1, Scene 1 shows that he can't handle anything that he feels challenges his authority or rectitude. He explodes, invokes hordes of gods, shouts, so what else is Goneril to do to restore order in the house? And indeed, and this comes down to directorial interpretation, has Lear's presence really resulted in such head-splitting chaos? In Peter Brooks's production, the answer is a resounding yes. Here are Lear's knights leaving Goneril's abode. Detested kite, thou liest. My train are men of choice and rarest parts, but all particulars of duty know, and in the most exact regard support the worships of their name. Brooks's timing of the castle trashing is hugely ironic. It takes place immediately prior to a leer to Goneril insult and a laughable claim that the former's train are men of choice and rarest parts that all particulars of duty know. We have just seen tables overturned, benches thrown from balconies, and in general been exposed to a cacophony of smashing up sounds. And here Lear is indignantly claiming that his men are the very finest in the land. And the effect of this is to swing the tide of sympathy back towards one of those generally thought of as evil sisters, with the implication that Lear may largely have only himself to blame for his devastating downfall. Let's move on. Jocelyn Morehouse's film A Thousand Acres is based on James Smiley's novel of the same name. 
Inspired by King Lear, it tells the story of hugely successful landowner Larry Cook, who decides to hand over control of his thousand acres to his daughters. Just as in King Lear, the youngest daughter is disinherited, although in slightly different circumstances. In Shakespeare, Lear wants his ego tickled by effusive declarations of love prior to dishing out thirds. Here in A Thousand Acres, Larry doesn't bother with all that. Instead, he explains pragmatically that he doesn't want his daughters to be lumped with all those inheritance taxes and asks in a light-hearted manner for positive feedback on his plan to form a corporation. So whereas it seems Shakespeare's Cordelia objects primarily to the public love-giving required rather than necessarily the plan itself, A Thousand Acres Caroline has serious misgivings about her father giving, giving up his life's work in this way. Following vicious arguments with his eldest two daughters, Larry Cook spends some time in an almighty storm and eventually dies following a brief reconciliation with his favourite youngest daughter. A crucial difference between A Thousand Acres and King Lear is the far greater prominence given to the lives and stories of the two elder sisters. As is unsurprisingly suggested by the name of Shakespeare's play, King Lear is predominantly about the life and experiences of King Lear himself. We see his change from omnipotent leader to humbled sufferer and empathise with him accordingly. However, this inevitably results in a twisted Lear-centric perspective. Our opinion of other characters, such as Goneril, Regan, Albany and Cornwall, will be formed largely on our view of their interactions, opinions of and relationship with Lear far more than any other character. To give you an example of the problems of this, as a teacher in the past, I've come across the occasional naughty pupil. Not many, but the occasional one. If I were to pen a play about these particular pupils, I would only be able to talk about them from their dealings with me inside the classroom. Would this result in fair, balanced portrayals of their character? Just because a pupil is occasionally naughty or cheeky or bone idle in an afternoon English lesson, does that mean that they inevitably behave in this way with their parents, other family members, other teachers? And I think this is what Jane Smiley, the writer, and subsequently Jocelyn Morehouse, the director, attempts to address in A Thousand Acres. The equivalent characters to Goneril and Regan, Ginny and Rose, note the same first letters, as is the case with Caroline and Cordelia, are given their own lives and stories independent of their father, which frankly is what you would expect, given that they are, that they are all grown up and married. Crucially, these stories have tragic undertones and result in the viewer revisiting their own ideas as to whether an adult child's apparently harsh treatment of an old parent can be, if not justified, then at least empathise with. Or more specifically, whether a goner and Regan may not be the she-devils that Lear's admittedly glorious emotive rhetoric frequently suggests. Towards the beginning of the film, we discover that Rose has had breast cancer resulting in the loss of a breast. Morehouse chooses to show Rose's doctor physically examining her for lumps. Maybe I should have the other one off for symmetry. I want to buy something pretty. I want to do stuff I've stopped myself doing. You know, mommy dying of exactly the same thing, I didn't think I had a chance. No, I, I thought it'd get me for sure. I know, it's only the three-month check, and there's the six-month and the one year. And, but I believe him, Ginny. I'm going to be okay. <laughs> the inclusion of this scene makes Rose both likeable and an object of empathy. The comment about having the other breast off for symmetry is self-deprecatingly darkly humorous. Whilst it is wonderful to see her renewed hope as she holds up dresses against herself in the mirror. Meanwhile, the reference to her mother and the fact she died of exactly the same thing brings to mind another question about the text which inspired A Thousand Acres. What on earth happened to Goneril Regan and Cordelia's mother? She is not mentioned at all, and indeed the presence of children with fathers but not mothers is notable across a number of Shakespeare plays. Celia and Rosalind in As You Like It, Miranda in The Tempest, Hero in Much Ado About Nothing, Katerina and Bianca in The Taming of the Shrew, Hermia in A Midsummer Night's Dream, Desdemona in Othello, to name a few. Does Shakespeare have something against mothers, or indeed happily married parents with children? 
Does the absence of the stereotypically more nurturing, understanding parent allow for greater conflict within parent-child relationships and therefore more powerful drama? But to return to A Thousand Acres, Ginny and Rose's regular referencing of their mother helps highlight both how they had missed a protective maternal figure, but also by extension the problems of being brought up by just a father, particularly one as stubborn as and unemotional as both Larry Cook and King Lee himself. Whilst Rose has had breast cancer, Ginny, the equivalent to Goneril, has likewise suffered her own personal tragedies. Here she is revealing all in two senses to Harold, played by Colin Firth with a wholly unconvincing Zebulon County accent. Ask you a question. How come you and Ty don't have kids? I've had five miscarriages. Jesus. Jenny. Ty only knows about three of them. He, he couldn't stand the disappointment after that, so I've kind of kept the fact that I'm still trying to myself. It's kind of like a last chance. What? Didn't your doctor tell you not to drink the well water? What? There's been stuff written about this for years. Jenny, the fertilizer runoff drains into the aquifer, and you drink it. Well, Rose drinks it. It doesn't affect everyone the same. Given that Harold also sleeps with Rose and vanishes from Zebulon County for 13 year, years before returning towards the beginning of the film, he is a Thousand Acres equivalent character to Edmund. Charming and irresistible to women, but untrustworthy and with complex issues in relation to his father. However, this scene once again sheds light on what Shakespeare does and doesn't include within his masterpiece. In King Lear, there is merely a bitter, increasingly desperate tug of war for Edmund between Goneril and Regan, characterised by bitchy comments. For example, Goneril, after poisoning her sister so that she can savour Edmund all by herself, sneers, mean you to enjoy him. Yes, there are the occasional courteous exchanges between Edmund and either Goneril or Regan, but nothing resembling the tender intimacy of Harold and Ginny's back, back of abandoned car kerfuffles, or the subsequent conversation. Ginny may technically be committing adultery, but the director is keen to emphasise that she doesn't usually leap into bed with other men. She says specifically, I haven't slept with other men, I've only slept with Ty, which allows the viewer to appreciate the emotional connection that has sprung up between the two adults and put the deceit temporarily to one side. With mellow orchestral music playing in the background, Ginny is able to confide gently that she has had five miscarriages, something which pulls at the heartstrings of the viewer. Given the amount of trauma she has experienced, many of us may feel that she might deserve the emotional pleasure of an occasional illicit romp. Ginny's candid confession of her sexual inexperience, in spite of her ecstatic extramarital smooches, is also important in helping mould the audience's response to her father's misogynistic pre-storm outbursts. Watch this. Larry has some things to say. Damn right I have. Daddy, it's going to storm. Why don't I take you home and we can talk in the morning? I don't want to go home. You girls stick me there. We don't stick you there. It's the nicest house. Daddy, you've lived there your whole life. <laughs> Let me take you home. Oh. Go with Rose now Let and Larry then have tomorrow. A I'd rather stay out in the storm than be stuck back there. What you want, you will anyway. Spoken like the bitch you are. Daddy. You don't have to drive me around anymore. Or cook the goddamn breakfast or clean the goddamn house. Or tell me what I can do and what I can't do. Because the bitch is a, a dried up whore bitch. Larry. Get off. Come on. He 
and I'll take you home, and you can apologize to Ginny now in the morning. Now don't you make me have to be crazy. I know you're king. But you girls drive me crazy. I give you everything I got. And what do I get in return? Just some orders about doing this, doing that. We didn't ask for what you gave us. Maybe it's high time we got some reward for what we gave you. Say you know all about Jenny. Well, Daddy, I know all about you, and you know I know. This is what we've got to offer, this same life, nothing more, nothing less. You don't want to go elsewhere. Get somebody else to take you in, because I, for one, have had it. You hear her? She talks to me almost worse than you do. You think this is bad, Daddy? You'd be amazed at what you really deserve. As far as I'm concerned, you're on your own now. Your house is down the road. You can get there. I'm going inside. Oh, now, don't think you can treat me like this. I'll throw you whores off the place. I'll stop the building. I'll get my land back. You'll never have children. You have a hope. And your children are gonna laugh when you die. Okay, it's it. Larry, let's go home now. Come on. Come on. Come on, get off of me. In this version, the father's outburst seems to stem largely from sulkiness of being left on his own. He bleeds limply and rather pathetically. I don't want to go home. You girls stick me there. And in another sharp contrast with Shakespeare, both the daughters know that their father has the nicest house within easy distance of their current location. Unlike Lear, who has literally nowhere to go, Cook would rather stay out in the storm to make an emphatic, childish point. Cook's language gets increasingly and despicably coarse, and when it degenerates into calling Ginny a dried-up whore bitch, we feel even more strongly than the Shakespearean audience member that comments of this nature are wicked and terribly unfair. The dried-up refers cruelly to his daughter's soulless battles to conceive, and the audience already sympathised with Ginny about her five miscarriages, even more so following Harold's revelation that her miscarriages were probably caused by the fertiliser entering the water supply, meaning that her father, as the man who set up the entire agricultural system initially, may have unwittingly prevented his eldest child from bearing his grandchildren. Meanwhile, calling her a whore is appalling anyway coming from a father, but even more so as we know such a label is particularly ludicrous aimed at one who has only slept with two people in her entire life. One effect of this scene is to emphasise the point that there has to be a limit to the traditional loyalty and respect shown from child's parents. Yes, of course, we owe our parents a debt of gratitude for bringing us up, feeding us, looking after us, and in Leah Cook's case, passing on the fruits of their life's work prior to death of their own accord. However, should this loyalty and respect remain exactly the same, irrespective of the parent's behaviour? Indeed, if that parent repeatedly calls you horse and makes a pathetic claim that your children are going to laugh when you die, should you still have to go out of your way to cater for their every needs? Another effect of this, of this scene is to make the audience consider the extent, if any, the daughters deserve the insults being thrown at them. I have already pointed out the bleeding the obvious, which is that Ginny doesn't deserve being, being called a dried up whole bitch. But Cook himself ironically reveals that actually his daughters have been helping him. When he says that they, um, that they don't need to drive me around or cook the goddamn breakfast or clean the goddamn house, he reveals that these two women, in spite of having husbands, other children, in spite of having battled the scars of breast cancer and miscarriages, have been reasonably helpful. And so we return to King Lear. Very similar situations and the same questions. Does Goneril make a reasonable effort to accommodate her father? I've discussed this point previously when arguing that the extent to which Leah's knights behave unacceptably will be down to a directorial interpretation. 
However, note Goneril's husband Albany's astonishment in Act 1, Scene 4 at Lear's anger, and he is probably the only good character from that side. He says, My lord, I am guiltless, as I am ignorant of what has moved you, suggesting perhaps a poor eye for detail for household, household harmony, but also the possibility that Lear has been reasonably accommodated up to this point. And as for the question as to whether any of the characters deserve the tirades Lear directs at them throughout the course of the play, emphatically not. Goneril, unlike Ginny of Thousand Acres, isn't permitted a voice to talk openly and tragically about her desperation to conceive, thus resulting in the reduced potential for sympathy from her audience. Nonetheless, does anyone deserve to be at the receiving end of such a fatherly outburst as the one dished out in Act 1, Scene 4? Here, nature, here, dear goddess, here. Suspend thy purpose, if thou didst intend to make this creature fruitful. Into her womb convey sterility. Dry up in her the organs of increase, and from her derogate body never spring a babe to honour her. This speech, this appalling curse, is incredibly shocking, and is likely to produce some sympathy for the poor woman on the receiving end. No woman deserves to hear such words spoken from anyone let alone a father. However, as with all of Lear's wonderful, epic speeches, the spotlight inevitably remains on him rather than his victims. They reveal his anger, his outrage, his incredible command of poetic language. We murmur, surely he can't mean this. These are terrible things to say to your daughter, we think. But we continue thinking about Lear and what's transfixed as he descends further away from his previously all-conquering heights. In A Thousand Acres, by contrast, we are forced to move away from this Lear Cook-centric perspective and to understand that daughters may have private difficulties and private lives about which their fathers may know nothing. These difficulties are likely to influence their behaviour, including their interactions with their father. Now, it would be idiotic to read or watch A Thousand Acres and to conclude that Goneril must have had a stack of miscarriages or Regan must have had cancer, thus explaining away their unsympathetic, harsh attempts to host their father. But it does make us realise what is missing from the story of King Lear, and that the absence of soliloquies or intimate moments for Goneril and Regan, but hundreds of lines in which Lear confides in his fool, Kent or Edgar, results in imbalance and the potential for unfair, harsh conclusions about characters who do not always see eye to eye with the fallen king. And so to return to the question, to what extent can women be blamed for the downfall of the men in their lives in Macbeth, King Lear and the related movie productions? Well, irrespective of production, Lady Macbeth must take a lion sized share of blame for pinpointing her husband's weaknesses so precisely in order to persuade him to act on the witch's exciting prophecies and kill Duncan. However, we also know that Lady Macbeth has no involvement whatsoever in the subsequent murders of Banquo, Lady Macduff and her children. And Macbeth's paranoid ruthlessness in ordering these murders may force the audience to reassess his role in the initial act of regicide. We must remember that Macbeth elects to consort conversationally with low-life murderers, Act 3, Scene 1, and alone elects to kill absolutely everything associated with Macduff, his wife, his babes, and all unfortunate souls that trace him in his line. Surely this suggests that Macbeth has always had the capability for evil within him, irrespective of female influence. Alternatively, could it be that succumbing to evil once, aided by your wife, results in a veritable tidal wave? In many respects, actually, the Lady Macbeth figure isn't to blame for her husband's descent into disloyal, disrespectful violence and subsequent chaos. Excluded by the men obsessed with their thing, and left maternally unfulfilled following her husband's insistence on an abortion, no wonder she feels no loyalty whatsoever to the Duncan figure, the ruthless gang leader Padrino Charlie D'Amico. And this can be the problem with certain modern day adaptations of Macbeth. If Duncan is not fundamentally a good man, or if his career is essentially amoral, then frankly it is not so much of a tragedy when he is killed, and therefore we don't judge his killers as much either. In Siberian Lady Macbeth, Katerina is most certainly to blame for the deaths of her husband and father-in-law, and indeed unlike her Shakespearean counterpart, 
her conscience seems serenely undisturbed by what she has done. Whereas Lady Macbeth and Rufi Battalia, in Ren Men of Respect, sleepwalk and obsess about cleanliness, the thing which really upsets Katerina is being betrayed by her surf lover, Sergei, in Siberia. Acts of murder have long been dismissed from her mind. In King Lear, Cordelia has a lot to answer for, with her thin-lipped, prim nonsense about nothing and nothing in Act 1, Scene 1. If she truly loves her father, why can't she humour the bigoted old fool on this occasion and help ensure his future well-being? However, Goran and Regan also seem rather ruthless and quick to act in ganging up together to banish their father from their homes. Note also how they complacently allow him to storm off into the terrible storm without making any effort to bring him back, unlike in A Thousand Acres, in which the equivalent characters to Cornwall and Albany, Pete and Ty, can be seen desperately trying to shepherd Larry Cook into a car. A Thousand Acres rewrites the story of King Lear and encourage us, encourages us to think again about the behaviour of the daughters, should they revolve their lives entirely around a foolish old man who happens to be their father. Is it just possible that they have problems and concerns of their own which make it harder for them to put up with fathers who have been brought up on a permanent diet of doing whatever you want, whenever you want? Indeed, in the case of A Thousand Acres, childhood abuse from their father makes the audience even more sympathetic to them and more inclined to ask the question of King Lear, what has he done in the past, blatantly favouring Cordelia aside to make his two elder daughters so uninclined to put up with his nonsense. The female is to blame? Not so sure.